That's always a good we'll, idea. We'll, we'll um, see what we can do in the background uh, to get you up and running. Thank you. It's, it's asking me to grant browser access to screen recording. So apologies to all those who, who are having fun and games with this. Um, normally it's fine on Safari, but it doesn't want to play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a why I believe the patient's time is more important than ever. And, you know, so my mind, you know, it's patient's time is the most important currency. So why, you know, and how do we maximize patient's time? How do we minimize wasted time? And how do we prioritize patient's time? Because while our time is busy and important, our patient's time is sacred. And at the heart of this, it comes from some work I was doing. Um, I'm in Christchurch in New Zealand right now. It's about five past nine at night. And I've been talking about a decade or more ago now to a group of older people, nurses, doctors, therapists, managers, about waste and the amount of waste in the system, implying lean thinking. And one of the things I did find was the biggest waste of all is people's time. And out of nothing came this notion of the last thousand days. And, and here's the thing, you know, this, this rhetorical question, if you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? And, and you know, it was a privilege and a joy to spend, uh, you know, an hour or so with uh, Roy a few weeks ago on a chat. And, and, you know, Roy's answer, everyone's answer largely would be none. None of us would want to spend time in hospital because what we would want to do is spend that with the people we love. We'd want to spend that time in our own bed, not in a hospital bed. And I do love the work. Uh, two wonderful books in, of the last 18 months are Dr. Catherine Mannix's With the End in Mind and Dr. Rachel Clark, uh, Dear Doctor, both palliative care physicians, both passionate about doing the right thing. And I, and I love Catherine Mannix's um, line, which about there's only two days that have fewer than 24 hours in each lifetime, sitting like bookmarks astride our lives. One is celebrated every year, and yet is the other that makes the, us still living as precious. And I, I, you know, I, I reflect on that often, that we celebrate birthdays, but what becomes more and more important to us as the days pass by is, is that, you know, we, they are not infinite. And I have more days in nursing behind me now than I have ahead of me. I was 39 years in my profession last month. This morning or today, I was teaching a group of Nightingale nurses. These are all nurses. It's a global thing supported by the International Council of Nurses, by the CNOs around the world. And all of these women and, and one man, all of these folk are less than under 35 years of age. It's about growing the next generation to step on shoulders. But I keep being reminded to myself that none of them were even born before I started in my profession. So I was being mindful of that and, and taking those plays preciously, but also being memorable that people who have a limited the life-limiting illness, every moment becomes even more precious because waiting a minute feels like 10. Waiting 10 minutes feels like half an hour and waiting for half an hour feels like an eternity. And I'm acutely aware that this is the international year of the nurse and the midwife. And back in March of this year, when there was lockdowns everywhere, the world kind of went into this massive global social experiment. There was a lot of, particularly in the United States at the time, a lot of pushback. And an Arizona ICU nurse called Lauren Leander on her day off came to the, the anti-lockdown protest, the anti-mask protest, the anti-belief that coronavirus was a thing, and she stood silent witness. She stood in silence. The only time she spoke was when people invaded her personal space. And she stood in silent witness for those who said it was false, fake news, and would say, if you came with me, I would give you scrubs, we'd get you in PPE, and we, you could come and see what I have to deal with every single day. That is, if, if people are say to me, what, you know, what is your definition of nursing? I would describe it as that nursing is social justice in action. And then later in the years, following the murder of, of, of George Floyd, you had nurses and doctors and therapists and people in outside Mount Sinai taking the knee, remembering what he does, because black lives matter. And sometimes social justice is even more important than social distance. 
and recognizing that the time that has been burgled from people during a time of COVID is something we need to be mindful of and that the, the JAMA, the General Medical Association, American Medical Association, thinks today's report Report, saying that there's been an excess of 300,000 deaths in the United States. There's 50 or 60,000 in the UK. And you just magnify that around the world, the lives that ended sooner than they might otherwise have been. But we talk too often, I think, about the language of the front line. And it's a glib phrase that particularly beloved by the politicians who talk about looking at a frontline staff and all of this stuff. The problem with the notion of a frontline is it infers as a backline that doesn't matter. But you try and run a health system or a social care system without the people who are organizing it themselves and enabling people to do their work. During the lockdown, I work in a 3,000 square meter design lab and we had half of the payroll team. They worked all the way through Christmas, through Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Good you know, Easter Monday, because they wanted to make sure that the staff, one thing they didn't need to worry about is would they be paid? And because, the, you know, it's about a, it takes a village. It's much more than the doctors, the nurses, the therapists, the cleaners. It is all of us. There is no front line, there is no back line, there is no them, there is only us. And tied into that front line is the notion of these battlefield metaphors of the body. This sort of warmongering rhetoric we hear, again, beloved of people who love to beat their chests and talking about these things. And what they'll talk about is things like the war against COVID or heart disease or cancer and so about battling disease and fighting infection and aggressive treatments and immune defenses and if somebody is compliant and quietly goes to meet their maker what do we talk of them as brave and I think there's real problems with that language of bravery because what if somebody's afraid and we too often have seen people who've died alone and afraid the only connection they've had was through FaceTime, not face-to-face. -face. And, and the notion of brave patients applies a morality which I don't think is helpful. You know, I lost both of my parents to cancer. I lost my best friend to cancer. It wasn't about whether they were brave or not. Cancer is amoral. It's about the language we use, which is freighted, and it takes away people's time. It steals people's time because they think they're spending their time worrying, are they brave enough? And there's a great, great phrase that my business partner, Linda Holt, talks about is the whirlwind of worry that's so prevalent in the times we live in. And I think about people like my you know, dear friend, Natalie Sylvie, and a, a, an iconic photograph of her selfie she took of her and mask with her face all marked from PPE, where she had spent nine hours traveling around London. She's an ICU registrar and traveling, taking patients to different places. And she's saying to people, you know, pleading with them, please, you know, stay, stay safe, stay distant, wear masks. But it's also worth us all remembering, this is not our first rodeo when it comes to pandemics. It's only in the last week or two, I was sent a picture by my sister of my Auntie Patsy. And my Auntie Patsy was a nurse and she trained in Dublin, then moved over to England, like so many did. And actually uniquely among the Irish um, diaspora, more women tra have traveled overseas than men. It's a unique national trait. And she was one of them. But my Auntie Patsy, who was born in 1931, died 23 years later in 1954, of tuberculosis. We sometimes forget that nurses and doctors and therapists and others have literally been the ones who go to work knowing that they are going to place themselves in harm. And the risk about the using the frontline battlefield um, uh, metaphors is that there's also the risk of people bringing home at harm and causing collateral damage to their loved ones. And a great book I've been, I read only a few weeks ago is a beautiful book by Emma Donoghue, who's uh, written The Pull of the Stars. And she talks about the origins of the word influenza. 
And influenza del stelle means the influence of the stars. Influenza is from medieval uh, Italian, meaning influence. And the most famous uh, star-crossed lovers were the Romeo and Juliet, because the belief in medieval Italian times was that the stars determined our futures. They determined what lives we might have. But when it comes to valuing people's time, one thing hopefully, please God, will come sooner rather than later is an effective vaccine. And a question we will have to rhetorically ask is when it comes to the COVID vaccines, whose time will matter most? Because we know that it'll be first targeted at the most vulnerable, but also those who work in healthcare, particularly in the in the highest risk areas like ICU and, and ED and elsewhere. And there will be a queue. And one thing that COVID has done is the, the lifetime rituals that have endured many lifetimes, and it's upended those lives and upended those rituals. Those connections with older people where now people can't meet up, even in their own homes. The people who are going in full PPE to people's homes or to care home settings and don't realize that they haven't actually pulled down their jumper. The loneliness of a, of a funeral where there's nobody there with them. The the, the, fourth, the consequence of shielding that occurs. And what often too often happens is I don't like the world shielding, partly because of its me, 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 battlefield metaphor, but it's also something where it's not, it, it, maybe we should be thinking of rather than shielding is protecting endangered species, as Dr. Lazar Morton talks about, or that great Irish word, which I really like, which is cocooning. But one of the consequences of whatever language you use is we have more endemic loneliness. And the work of Holt Lundstedt and, and, and Roy generously shared some of this work on, on his uh, brilliant blog, um, is about a 27% increase in early mortality related to loneliness. Loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And when I've spoken to some people who I know are isolated and on their own, that is what they talk about. But the other thing that's happening globally is we are having the biggest global deconditioning happening in real time in people's own homes. People don't have to come into hospital now to get deconditioning, where we can at least seek to end their PGA paralysis. Deconditioning causes harm where they are, where they live, and it's stealing their precious time. Because in the end, when it comes to you know the, the end PGA paralysis campaign last thousand days, it's an absolute amazing tribute to the brilliant work of the Academy of Fab Stuff because of that you know the work you Roy and Terry's done and and Pete Gordon and others Liz Sargent has been here and and you know Amory Riley and Tim Gillen so many this is a huge village but ye started it ye amplified it ye galvanized it you I served as a way of getting that message out there and I sincerely thank you for that because leadership is never about power. It's not about resource. Leadership is ultimately about influence. Where people believe what you believe, they will follow you. And as I draw this inarticulate speech of the heart to its end, to my mind, is why, why does care, why will it always triumph over cure? And I think it's for this reason. Care ultimately, sorry, cure ultimately is limited. There's only so much cure we can give someone. But the need for care is unlimited. That's why we don't have intensive cure units. We have intensive care units. Because in the end, when it comes to cure, death can, and in the end, must intervene and prevail. But when it comes to care, our need for care is endless. I need to hear arise before we we see the light of day, and it is after the last time we close our eyes. And we die only we die three times. We die the first time when our body fails us. We die the second time when our body is passed into the earth or gone to the curtain. And the last time we die is when our name is uttered for the last time. But we can live on through decency, 
through kindness, to the impact we have on other people's lives. who may never know who we are, but they know the impact we have made. And the work of the Academy of Fast Off is the Fat Change Day. This is about the celebration of all that is possible, all that is good, all that is achievable, all it is about people who dream out loud at high volume and make a difference. Because at the end of our own last thousand days, you know, if we can say I was loved, I mattered, and I was simply enough, then we know we've had the life of a social millionaire. Because some people are so poor, all they have is money, whereas social millionaires make a difference, value people's time, give them their dignity, give them their respect, give them their sense that they matter. And if you can do all of those things, when you look back on your last thousand days, however many days it may be, you can know you mattered and you mattered a great deal. So thank you so much for the generosity of your time and apologies to you for the technological details. Brian, that was marvellous. Thank you. Uh, the good news is that halfway through your uh, your beautiful smiling face came up on my screen. So I'm not quite sure which particular gremlin we fixed, but whoever it is in the background that fixed it, thank you very much. <laughs> Brian, I didn't get it. We've gone until um, uh, 9.30 um, uh, and uh, I'm on pain of death to finish on time because... Uh, uh, you know, we've got such a busy program, but I'm pleased we've got time to have a bit of a chat anyway. I mean, first of all, how are you? That's, uh, that's you know, how are you doing? Well, you know yourself, you know, staying positive and testing negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, yeah we're, we're staying positive and we're wondering if we will ever test, test negative. I don't know. Anyway, there's a joke going around where... Matt Hancock, who's, who's, who's going to be speaking at a conference, he turned up and the microphone wasn't on and he tapped it and said, testing, testing. And the audience just fell about laughing. Uh, anyway, uh, I promise not to tell I that. Joke. Like that. Yes. <laughs> uh, as always, Brian, it was a fantastic. Uh, you, you have such a wonderful turn uh, of phrase. Do you, I mean, the, the theme really uh, of our conference today is, is you know, respecting the past, of course, and taking the best of it into the future. Um, when you and I talked uh, before about, you know, what you'd learned from COVID and what you were going to take into the future, you gave me a really rather surprising answer. And, and I don't know if you can remember what it was now, but it, 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 you were saying really that the system worked so well in New Zealand, there wasn't a lot you had to change. I, I thought that was terrific. That's right. It, was a, it, it is. And you, and you look at it right now and you see the extraordinary things. You know, there was 46,000 people at the rugby last Sunday against the Wallabies. Nobody worried about social distancing. Um, you know, right now, I think there's two cases in the whole of New Zealand that are not in managed isolation. In fact, they've gone into my MIQ, uh, managed isolation uh, facilities. So it, it just followed the science. It didn't talk about following it. It just got on with it. And empathic values-based leadership. And, you know, the election was held at the weekend. And it, um, it was an overwhelming landslide for a leader who is, I don't want to call her the anti-Trump, but she's the, she's the antithesis of all of the, uh, the um, unpleasantness that we see in other politicians. She's had an extraordinary landslide, wouldn't it? And I watched it on the TV, and I thought the uh, the opposition uh, leader was really grudging. Uh, yeah, yeah. they've they just got beaten yeah. right, left, and centre, and and you know it's a difficult thing to manage from the narrative point of view. But I thought it was a very grudging speech that she made. Really bad. It, it okay, was great. actually. The, you, you, you're quite right. I mean, if you you have to be magnanimous, don't you? If you get beaten, you get you get beaten, and that's it. Anyway, we need to move on from that. Um, so, what are your plans? Oh, uh, I guess getting back over here now is going to be tricky for you. Yeah, I've come to the realization I will make it home for Christmas, and that sucks. It means I will be over a year before I see my son. Um, and, and, you know, look, you know, it, it's become almost cliche to say it, but we're we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Yeah. And, um, you know, well, it is what it is. 
and and I think there's so many people much worse, but we all need. I mean, it's like grief, you know. Other people have worse, but everyone's got their own unique story and their own. There's, there's chapters that we don't talk about in our books of our lives. Um, but I feel at the same time a, a life of constant blessing, and I'm a pathological optimist, and I find it helps. And I think the other thing is, I often think, you know, what would it be like if it was 15 years ago? This would be happening. It would be hard to have a phone, you know, no, no FaceTimes, none of those things. So, you know, I think we have to keep things, the world in a degree of perspective and, and, and hold on. We'll yeah, get to the other end of this. I think that's really good advice, Brian. You know, keeping, holding a sense of perspective, I think is, is really important. And, you know, the, the thousand days that, that, you first drew to our attention um, uh, PJ paralysis, of course, it flowed out of that. But the thousand days, do you do you think that the the intensity that we've had with COVID and and the focus that there's been on death and dying and losing relatives and the mental health pressures that there are with all that, that's somehow amplified the thousand day message, don't you think? It it's somehow um, you know, previously it was, you know, well, yeah, it's the thousand days. But right now, actually, we're seeing people that we never expected uh, to die. You know, I've, I've, I've lost, uh, I haven't lost any relatives because I haven't got any relatives. They're all dead. But the, what well, I've lost, you know, I, there's a guy that used to look after my jag, right? And um, I, I needed uh, some some work done on it, and I rang the garage. There was no answer. I rang the garage, no answer. Eventually, I got an answer. It was a woman's voice. I said, "Oh, I just want to, you know, are you open? Can I bring it?" She said, "I'm really sorry to tell you, Mr. Lilly, but my father died." And uh, you, you know, I kind of came face to face with it, and he was uh, he wasn't a young man. He'd you know been around a long time. Excellent man. Uh, got COVID. Went in never survived and it, it i don't know i think it, it just did something to me right, and I, I think this has been a, a shocking year for so many of us um and and any of us on this you and i we all we all have these stories you know um and, and let's not forget if you are black asian minority ethnic member you're more likely even to sleep this stuff you know so you add, that's an amplification on a different level again. And it, it does strike me, I mean, I, lo I love the work of um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who, you know, famously talked about, um, you know, denial, anger, you know, the whole grief thing, you know. And David Hassler, who worked with her, uh, he came up with a nice traditional element to it. You know, what it is, um, denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance. And he came to one last piece, which is meaning. And I think one of the things we need to see in all of this, and we're still processing our way through this, is to get a sense of meaning of what is an intensely historic time. And some years have got so much history. But I think my personal word of the year is liminality. Because what we've done is we've said goodbye to the past, but we're not fully sure what the future holds. And the liminality is that uncertain space that we hold ourselves in. And it is where everything feels uncertain and, and you go to a garage and you discover this thing that person has died and we're kind of rocking back trying to make meaning and sense of it. And I think this is why, I, you know, you know I'm conscious we've got about two minutes. Just very quickly, I just want to quote uh, John O'Donoghue, my favourite Irish poet and philosopher, and he talks about it. This is the time to be slow. Lie low to the wall until the bitter weather passes. Try as best you can not to let a wire brush of death out. Scrape from your heart all sense of yourself and your hesitant light. If you remain generous, time will come to it. And you will find your feet again on fresh pastures of promise, where the air will be kind and blush with begin. I think we sometimes remember to hold on to those thoughts. Those blushes of beginning and that air of promise that is yeah. way for us all. Brian, th that's a fabulous note uh, to end. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from New Zealand. I'm really sorry uh, that we had the technical problems. Who knows? But we've got a full recording of what you said. So if 
we will record it uh, as a podcast and we'll make sure that it's available. So uh, our, our thanks. I'm very pleased to see you well. I'm very sorry that you won't be back for Christmas because I think we did have a date in the diary, but I guess that I'll have to wait for another time. So bless you. Uh, bless your work and the inspiration that you bring us all, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. God bless. Thanks for everything. Bye-bye.